couple weeks ago talking about Cleopatra and Antony, and I'm very excited to see where we go next. Um, this event is part of the Santa Fe Summer Shakespeare Festival, uh, which is a group of eight different theater companies who are all producing Shakespeare-related content. Just to give you a taste of what's going on, this weekend, um, the Santa Fe Playhouse is co-producing with the More You Know Collective, a fellow of the remix at Santa Fe Playhouse. Saw it this afternoon. Phenomenal. Definitely recommend seeing one of the last shows uh, if you can get to it. The Upstart Crows are finishing their rough season weekend of Antony and Cleopatra and Andrew Cleese and the Lion. We have our talk with Dwayne Roller here today. And then tomorrow night, some of the same um, folks who did the Othello the Remix will be doing a lecture performance here called Shakespeare Was a Rapper. Oh. Um, so that should be really fun. So please do come out for that as well. In a two weeks, uh, August 26th, um, the ISC Rep Company will be opening, it will be opening Ooh. night of Julius Caesar. Um, and then two days later, the opening night of Coriolanus. So we really hope you'll join us. Their outdoor performances um, should be a lot of fun. I keep saying fun, like I don't really associate fun with like deep Roman tragedies, but they are fun, they're really fun. So we would uh, highly encourage you to please come and join us. Um, other than that, let me see, safety things, the exit is where you came in as well as over here. And I'll unlock that right now, so you your thing. Um, please, if you have a tiny computer that you like to keep in your bag, please turn it off. It's always programmed to go off during the most poignant moment of any presentation. Um, and without further ado, Dwayne Roller and Shakespeare and the Roman World. Thank you. It's nice to be back here. And I'm going to talk about Coriolanus and Julius Caesar and try and contextualize them into the Roman world and into what Shakespeare did with them. <clears throat> and of the four plays of Shakespeare that are devoted to Greco-Roman history, and we know what those are, Antony and Cleopatra, Time on Julius Caesar, and Coriolanus. <clears throat> Coriolanus is the most enigmatic. Uh, the three others more or less connect with one another. Uh, Julius Caesar and, and Antony and Cleopatra obviously are in very close sequence. And Timon is an expansion of an incident that occurred to Antony. <clears throat> but Coriolanus stands alone. And it's a, a character and personality study of a Roman of the early 5th century BC. So, so hundreds of years before the world of Caesar and Antony and Cleopatra. And Coriolanus to Roman historians remains vague and almost mythical. Uh, whether you look at modern interpretations or whether you look at what the ancient writers have to say about him. <clears throat> As we know, Caesar, Antony, and Cleopatra were very real people of the second half of the first century BC, and we have a vast amount of information about them <clears throat> because many of the characters in those two plays wrote their own memoirs. Caesar did, Cicero did, Octavius did. Uh, we don't necessarily have them, but the sources we have made use of them. Uh, Cicero and Octavius knew all of the protagonists. So it, it's a real world that Shakespeare developed in his own way. And none of these writings survive except for some of Caesar's and some of Cicero's. But they, they were summarized and handed down into the authors like Plutarch that Shakespeare made use of. <clears throat> Even though there are many controversies and many uncertainties, nevertheless, we're on firm historical ground in the world of Caesar, Antony, and Cleopatra. But Coriolanus is another matter. 500 years earlier, belonging in the vague world of early Roman history, some modern scholars even question his very existence. And the play does remain kind of an outlier in Shakespeare's historical writings. Uh, we have no doubt where he got his material. As I said last time, it's the same thing. Plutarch's biography as available in Thomas North's 1570 
1979 translation of Jacques Amiot's 1572 French edition of Plutarch. No, no, no question at all there. And in fact, Shakespeare remained much closer to North for the Coriolanus than for the three other plays, with almost verbatim lines from North in the play, allowing, of course, for the necessary metrical uh, adjustments. Shakespeare may also have been aware of the account of Coriolanus and the Roman historian Livy of the late first century BC. He was a contemporary of Antony and Cleopatra and all those folks. And that was available in English in 1600. And there are some other ancient sources. But Coriolanus is such an early and indeed vague personality that all the sources that we have put together that mention Coriolanus hardly diverge from one another. And so we come back to Norse Plutarch, which even more than in the other plays is Shakespeare's source. It's hard to say what drew Shakespeare to Coriolanus. Plutarch has a number of biographies of several people in early Roman history, of which the best known is his biography of Romulus, uh, the person who allegedly founded Rome. But there's no continuity between these four or five biographies of early Roman history. Uh, most of the personalities are relatively obscure, and it's not like the ten biographies that he has of Romans of the second and first century BC, which provide a continuum of over a hundred years of, of Roman history. The early Roman biographies, moreover, are bordering on the mythic. Uh, Romulus and Numa, the second king of Rome, Coriolanus, and a couple of others. The, the very mythic world of early Roman history. <clears throat> It has been suggested, and not being a Shakespeare scholar, I can't uh, talk about the validity of this, that Shakespeare was drawn to the career of Coriolanus because of the social discord that is apparent throughout the play, which was a possible parallel with the social discord in England after the death of Elizabeth the first and the accession of King James the first between the, the monarchy and the ruling elite. Uh, but this remains speculative. It's, it's certainly quite possible. We just never know what brings a genius to a particular topic. So, what was the world in which Coriolanus functioned? Uh, let's look for a bit at early Roman history insofar as we know it. The Romans believe that Rome was founded in 753 BC by our reckoning. It was founded on the lower Tiber River about seven miles inland. And the Tiber River cuts straight down through Italy. It starts up in Tuscany and goes straight down and then curves into the ocean. So it forms a barrier. Basically, to go from northern to southern Italy, you have to cross the Tiber. And about seven miles inland, there's a place where the Tiber makes an S-curve. And there's an island. The S-curve slows the waters, obviously, and the island makes crossing of it easier. And I have to say, if you've been to Rome, uh, the Tiber is much less than it used to be. It's been channelized, it's been drawn off for irrigation, so we have to think of it as a major, fast-moving barrier. But here was a place you could cross the river easily. So, 753 or whenever, a village grew up at a place where there were bluffs that came right down to the Tiber. These are the seven hills of Rome, of which there are about ten of them. So the bluffs came right down to the river. There's the island, a good crossing point. This village grew up, and basically they could control all transport between northern and southern Italy. And no one could have imagined that this simple trading village on the lower Tiber would come to rule the world. And that, of course, is one of our existential problems in dealing with early Roman history, because all our sources 
are from the period when Rome ruled the world, and there was a kind of manifest destiny among the Romans in thinking that this was all inevitable. From the founding of Rome, the famous story of Romulus and Remus being suckled by a wolf and so forth, whether or not it's true, from this little village, which is would have been a tiny little place on the Palatine and Capitoline Hills, to the great Roman Empire of hundreds of years later, was seen by the Romans as inevitable. It wasn't. It was through a series of unexpected events that caused, among other things, a certain amount of social instability. Now, in the beginning, Rome was ruled by kings. And that's the normal social structure for Italian towns and villages of this period, which we would call the Iron Age. And after about 200 and something years of kings, the kings were removed and a more broad-based government was established. That also is common. There's a tendency in much of the Mediterranean world, Greek and Roman world, to move from more restrictive forms of government to less restrictive forms of government. And so from Romulus through six others until about 500 or so BC, Rome was ruled by kings. And again, I have to emphasize that we're in kind of a mythic and folktale world here. Even though there are a number of very famous tales from early Roman history, perhaps originally grounded in some kind of reality, but they've become cultural icons, even though uh, we may doubt them, but ever since in art and literature, we, we have Romulus, and his brother Remus being suckled by the wolf. There's some evidence of wolf cult in central Italy at this time. You can take it as far as you want to. Uh, the famous story of the rape of the Sabine women. I mean, think of all the artistic and literary representations of these issues. And most important to bring us to Shakespeare, the rape of Lucretia, or Lucrece, as Shakespeare calls her. She was the subject of a lengthy poem that Shakespeare wrote detailing the assault on Lucretia, who was the wife of a distinguished Roman, and the assault was perpetrated by the son of the king, who would turn out to be the last king of Rome. And this revolt, uh, resulted in a revolt by a person named Brutus, who's a direct ancestor of the Brutus we all know, and that's an important point in understanding the character of the later Brutus. And he's also probably an ancestor, maybe the father, uncle, of the Brutus and Coriolanus. Brutus's revolt expelled the monarchy and established a system called the Republic. Now, we can raise questions here, obviously, uh, it's perhaps unlikely that an assault on a noble woman caused a massive social upheaval. But in one sense, it's probably part of the problem. It probably represents some kind of class or social antagonism. And that's the way people looked at things in antiquity. They had, the ancient scholars had little concept of what we might call broad anthropological or sociological causes of things. And they tended to put uh, changes in society into very personal contexts. Some of these are almost ludicrous today. Uh, we very much doubt that the great Median Empire fell because the king got bad advice from his eye doctor. <laughs> uh, we very much doubt that the Lydian Empire went through a regime change because the captain of the guard happened to see the queen naked. Mm. So it, it's these very personal causes that are the way history was looked at in antiquity and the way it's looked at in our context here is that the assault on Lucretia by the son of the king meant that the king was run out of town and his family and a republic was established. Well, we can no, we can, no need to doubt 
that this change took place. Around 500 BC or so, the kings left somehow, were expelled, were assimilated, whatever, and a broad-based government that was called the Republic, the res publicae, the matters of the people, was established, which became one of the long last, longest lasting governments in ancient history. And it was a relatively broad-based government for that time and place, where the government was run by two consuls, advisors, probably originally advisors to the king, where the name comes from. But when you have two people in charge, it's a very stable government. One or three is unstable. One, obviously, three, because as we find out in the world of Julius Caesar, two can gang up on the third. But with two consuls who always have to agree, it's a very stable form of government. And as I said, it lasted for nearly 500 years. So for whatever complex sociological reasons, the monarchy was expelled around 500 BC. And the tale, of course, of the rape of Lucretia became another one of those cultural icons from early Roman history, whether or not it happened. And obviously intrigued Shakespeare. This is not something that's in Plutarch, really. His source was probably Livy the historian or the Roman poet Ovid, neither of which was available in English at the time Shakespeare wrote the poem, only available in the original Latin or French, which is a good insight into Shakespeare's language abilities. So the expulsion of the monarchy, 500, 510, something like that. Within a very few years, we're in the world of Coriolanus. Coriolanus is said to have captured the city of Corioli, location unknown, but somewhere south of Rome, not very far. We have to remember that Rome at this time is a tiny little village still, and that everything we're talking about is almost within the sprawling urban area of modern Rome. So Coriolanus is said to have captured the village of Corioli in 493, and he was named Gaius or Gnaeus Marcius, but he got the surname Coriolanus from this event. <clears throat> By this time, as is very apparent in the play, there is social discord in Rome. Obviously a convulsion of the change from monarchy to republic. Uh, we're, we're less than a generation after the expulsion of the kings, and problems are still very much apparent. And in Rome at this time, there were two broad social classes. The patricians, who are the wealthy aristocrats, and, and the plebeians, who are kind of the middle class, the lower middle class. Uh, there, there's no real ethnic division between them. It's not like in many society, the, the original population and immigrants or anything like that. It's just the way society divided into a kind of an upper and a lower class with surprisingly parallel interests, but difference in, in terms of their wealth, in terms of the family organization. <coughs> and Marcius, who's not yet Coriolanus, uh, was of the wealthy aristocratic class and discord between the class that he represented and the plebeians. Now, Rome at the time was in conflict with the people known as the Volscians. And, the, and this again is an element of early Roman history that as Rome became more and more important, as Rome expanded, they tended to have conflict with the people around them. The first people they had conflict was, with was the Sabines. And the Sabines are northeast of the core of Rome. You're still well within the modern city, but northeast of Rome. And then there are others in the Volscians. And this again is inevitable as Rome becomes the dominant power in the area. All of the little ethnic groups scattered around either become assimilated or take umbrage at it. And there's a fair amount of warfare in early Rome, which adds, of course, to the internal problem 
of the plebeians and patricians not getting along with each other. So the Volscians lived south of Rome at their center of Antium. Uh, Antium in later days is known for two things, really. One is it was the birthplace of Nero, and in a much more recent era, it's where the Allied forces landed in World War II. It's modern Anzio. So the Volscians lived down at Antium, and there's evidence that the Volscians and others were taking advantage of the regime change to cause trouble for the Romans. Marcius defeated the Volscians at Corioli, and as I said, we have no idea where that is, except it's probably somewhere between Rome and Anzio, earning his surname and he was designated consul, one of the two leading magistrates of the New Republic. But he used his power to act arrogantly toward the plebeians and was run out of town. He went over the Volscians, he gathered a force to attack Rome, but he was persuaded by his mother to make peace but in fact, he was killed by Alphidius, the Volscian leader, who seems to have been an old friend, which raises questions not really explored of exactly what the relationship was between Coriolanus and the Volscians. It, it, it's really a very simple tale. It has some traditional overtones, obviously, of the leader who cannot fit into society, who betrays his country, and then regrets it, but it leads to his own death. And Plutarch's biographies tend to come in pairs of a Greek and a Roman. Some of these are obvious, like Julius Caesar is paired with Alexander the Great, others less so. But Coriolanus is paired with Alcibiades, the student of Socrates, who left Athens and went over to the Spartans, and then came back was generally condemned and died a dismal death. So there are lifetime parallels here, although Alcibiades is a much more real person than Coriolanus. Certainly the context is good. It represents the chaotic situation of the early Republic and the early years of Roman expansionism. And it's probably grounded in historical events but overlain with traditional elements, as are these other events like Romulus and the Wolf and so forth. An interesting point, however, in the tale is the role of the two women, his mother Volumnia and his wife Vergilia. Powerful women were an element of early Rome. Uh, this is only a generation after the matter of the Sabine women. And I suppose you could say in a crazy way, Lucretia was a powerful wo woman too, because obviously if we deconstruct the story, what was a simple assault led to serious social changes. And, and there are other prominent women, less well known in the years of the early Republic. Now, one problem we have with Roman history is that all our sources for this material are from the time of Antony and Cleopatra. So there is a tendency to cast things back, as I alluded to before, and some of these prominent women may be anachronisms from the world of Cleopatra, Livia, Octavia, all the others that we know carrying those powerful women back into an earlier era. But nevertheless, Shakespeare realized he had something interesting here <laughs> and expanded Virgilia from a single mention in Plutarch to a rel relatively prominent person and gave Volumnia much more of a role than in Plutarch. Shakespeare knew well how to dramatize powerful women. Think about it. <laughs> and the speeches by Volumnia in Act Five are essentially totally Shakespeare's invention. And in one sense, even though it comes near the end, they're kind of the dramatic centerpiece of the play. 
as a final note before we leave Coriolanus, and there's not much more we can really say about it. It's a, a play by Shakespeare with all that means, but based on relatively limited and linear source material. But as a final note, the Volskians continued to have conflict with the Romans for over a century, in fact, until 358 BC, but still retained an ethnic identity way on down into the days of Caesar and Antony. In fact, Cicero was a Volskian ancestor.